Lord, I'm not worthy to eat your flesh, not worthy to drink your blood. Okay, I just come out of confession, right? Right. But it just doesn't work for me. I mean, if I do something wrong, I just want to pay for it my way. So I do my own penance for my own sins. What do you say, huh? That's a clip from a very old Martin Scorsese movie, Mean Streets. It's Harvey Cattell there. And Scorsese is going to come up a couple times in this introduction to my interview with the excellent Miguel Connor. This is kind of part two of an interview we did just a few weeks ago. And in this part two, I pulled Miguel back into my ongoing fascination with the conspiracy surrounding the origins of Christianity. So without getting too far into the weeds, which I don't think we can avoid getting too far into the weeds on this topic. Martin Scorsese has always been fascinating to me. He's obviously an incredible filmmaker, but he's also someone who is playing out in his art the larger Christian drama, the questions of good and evil, the questions of what are we supposed to do with our lives and our sins and all the rest of that. But he's not only playing it out in this artistic, metaphorical, archetype kind of way, he's also a practicing Catholic. He's meeting with the Pope and he buys into that stuff. I mean, here's a clip from an interview he gave about his faith, and in particular, his faith as a Catholic. I think it's the depth of faith. It's where one, it's the, the struggle for the very essence of faith. The vehicle that one takes towards faith can be very helpful. It's the church, the institution of the church, the sacraments. Yeah, I'm kind of with you right up till the end there, right up till the vehicle part. What if the vehicle, Christianity, Catholicism, Judaism, the Bible, what if that vehicle isn't what you've been told it is? What if the real vehicle sounds more like this? A bunch of Roman generals getting together in a little cave that they carved out underneath the Vatican that is the cult of Mithra's secret society, plotting how they're going to run the next PSYOP. And even though Scorsese didn't have a microphone on that conversation, I would suggest he came pretty close in his movie The Irishman, and in particular in this clip, where the modern-day instantiation of the cult of Mithras, that being the Italian mafia, are plotting the assassination of Caesar, I mean, the emperor, I mean, the president of the United States, JFK. Remember this clip? Between Bobby and the FBI up his ass all the time, he's going fucking crazy. Tell Jimmy I'm sorry for his troubles. The old-timer spoke to the old man. The old man talked to his son Jack, and he told him, don't forget who the fuck he owes. He knows who the fuck he owes. So maybe I'm right about the Josephus slash Vespasian psyop. I think I make a pretty good case, but maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. The real point is that it matters. It matters in some fundamental way if we're going to talk about this here and now reality. I mean, on another level, as our excellent guest, Miguel Connor, brings us back to at the end, Fundamentally, it doesn't matter. But it does matter. Listen to this show. But it doesn't matter. Listen to this clip. The game doesn't change. The most important thing is you're waking up and your inner flame or soul or consciousness. That's the most. I tell people, it doesn't matter if you walk out today and you see Bigfoot or you see an alien ship land or you find out that the Rockefellers are still worshiping Mithras and ruling our the United States government. Your job is still the same, which is to wake up and find out what your purpose is and move there. Because the other things, yeah, in a way it's fun, but compared to infinity to, as you say, extended consciousness and all that, it's a, a drop in the bucket. You know, Don't lose sight of the big game, which is who you are, which is just an amazing individual that has purpose and meaning in this world. Stick around for my interview with Miguel Connor. 
And please, I'll put out the plea again, share this show. I think this is such an interesting thing that we're working on. I want to work on it together. I want to hear from other people in this community who can either punch holes in this theory or add support to it in some way. Share this interview with anyone you think would be interested in hearing it. I have a bunch of new ways of sharing and interacting on the Skeptical website. Go there and check it out. And please join me in this fun, fun, fun discussion. Here's my interview with Miguel Connor. Nice. Okay. And I say that Miguel, cause uh, I want to pivot a little bit and uh, I might even break this into two parts because I am talking to Miguel Connor from Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. And we just had a great chat about his new book, 10 Snackable Meditations. And now I want to pull them in a totally different direction. So I, needed, I felt like I needed to pause. Miguel is one of my go-to people for these uh, kind of book projects. I feel compelled, even if no one reads them, you know, no one reads books. So I don't know how you're going to do with your book, but I, I think this is really, really such a, uh, uh, an interesting topic for me. And it's right up Miguel's alley. So this is going to be a little bit inside baseball. If you like that, well, then you're going to might, might enjoy it. If you don't, then you might not. So, Miguel, I did kind of tip my hand here a little bit in terms of what I wanted to talk to you about, but I've been seeing it almost as a Caesar's Messiah 2.0. I love Joe Atwell, and I just have a lot of respect for him. He's been on the show, even though he's not responding to my emails right now, because maybe the last time I had him on, I hit him too hard with the ET thing, and not everyone <laughs> is not everyone is as open as you are. Like I said, you can throw you in the middle of the pool and you you swim to the side. I'm going to jump right into a really uh, important quote that I think is the springboard for this whole discussion. And again, folks, inside baseball here, so I don't feel the need to kind of bring everybody up to speed. The point is, what is the origin, the true origin of Christianity? And is Christianity best understood first as a conspiracy theory? as a psyop, as an operation, a way to control the population, which the Romans were so, so adept at. Is that the first way that we should consider it? That doesn't mean that you can't have a personal spiritual relationship with Christ consciousness. I mean, I, one, no one can tell you you can't. I, you don't need me to give you the permission. But number two, I, 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 I'm convinced by the evidence that that is in whatever respect we want to call genuine, that is genuine. That's real. I don't know how that works, but it certainly seems to be true that you can have a genuine personal spiritual relationship with Jesus. That is completely separate from this. And when I say this, I mean none other than the writings of Josephus and the quick history reminder, Josephus is the primary source we have for this history. And even the uh, idiot historians who write about Josephus admit that he's a terrible source in one, in some respects. He's obviously biased in all these ways. But then they say, well, gee, I know we lost our keys out in the parking lot, but the light is so much better over here under the street lamp. Can't we look over here? Well, no, you can't if he's discredited. But here's what he wrote in War of the Jews. And I would suggest deep inside baseball now, this is the first psyop. This is the one that Joe from Caesar's Messiah missed. He missed this. He, he, he's aware of it, but he doesn't point out the significance of it. Josephus writes to his brethren, but what more than all else incited them to war, that is incited the Jews to rebel. Because this is, again, this is Josephus writing as he has joined Vespasian. So some people consider that a turncoat. I don't know what you call it. But the Romans land in Galilee and they put the sword to this guy's head and say, okay, dude, what do you think? You want to live or you want to die? Back to your thing uh, earlier. Do you want the million dollars or do you want to live till tomorrow? And he says, you know, I like living. So he <laughs> is then turns to writing to his, his audience, the Jews. And he, from the beginning says, I am the super Jew. I know more about, I'm a better Jew than anyone else because I've studied more. The other thing he says in this writing is, I'm going to tell you the truth, not like these other historians out there. I'm going to tell you the truth. Those are Josephus' own words in War of the Jews. 
Back to the thing. But what more than all else incited them to war was an ambiguous oracle, likewise found in their sacred scriptures to the effect that at the time, one from their country would become ruler of the world. Huh, Messiah, the Messiah. This they understood would mean someone of their own race. And many of the wise men went astray in their interpretation of it. All those Jewish elders at the temple, they went astray. Josephus is telling the general population in Judea. The oracle, however, in reality, signified the sovereignty of Vespasian. Vespasian is emperor, he's Caesar, right? Think Caesar, he's the new Caesar, he's the new guy in town who was proclaimed emperor on Jewish soil. So what he's saying is, hey, you know what? You missed this little trick in there. When our, our Jewish faith, all our books said that the Messiah would be a Jew, of course, they, they just missed it a little bit. What they really meant is that would come from Jewish soil. And this guy Vespasian, he landed here. Of course, he landed here to slaughter all of us, but he was on Jewish soil when it all happened. My point is, this cannot be understood to me as anything other than a psyop. There, there can't be anything authentic about this. What, what do you think? Oh, yeah. There's no doubt about that. I mean, uh, I guess I should quote Philip K. Dick's famous uh, dictum, the empire never ended, even if you don't take it literally. The Romans really created the ultimate... Uh, uh, you might say, system for control. And they had complete control over everything. I mean, for example, magic. The Romans over-regulated magic to the point that it just didn't work. And they had their hands. They knew magic could be dangerous in the hands of a population. You had to be like <clears throat> in the outside. So there was nothing. The Romans had control over everything. And this sort of template has been borrowed by empire after empire. And uh, the scholars, but even before Joe Atwell, scholars always said it's so obvious that Luke, the Gospel of Luke, borrows heavily from Josephus, that the, the Acts of the Apostles. Again, it's all Josephus, whoever Luke is just borrowing things and putting it with Josephus. So, but the question has to be is, uh, well, there's no doubt that the Roman fingers are on Christianity because the Romans were smart. They knew they had to control. There's evidence of them controlling other religions. There were, um, the question is really when and at what time? I mean, for example, we quoted Augustine in uh, this, our first half, Alex, and Augustine famously said, Christianity has always existed since the beginning of time. So what is, he, what is Augustine talking about? Well, he's kind of hedging his bets or stretching things. In other words, the idea of this mystery cult of a rising, dying God-man, whether it's Attis or Osiris or some of the many other dying and rising, sig signif signifying the renewal of the land, the renewal of your soul, the re rebirth, all that had always existed throughout before the Roman Empire, before the Greeks, and that was going around. And uh, Christianity was, you might say, the, the Jewish manifestation of this uh, mystery cult, the rising and dying godmen. We're getting into Echeria S sort of domains, and uh, Atwell and Echeria agreed on a lot of things, but disagreed on a lot of things. So when did this cult come in, and when did the Romans say, uh, what's the name of the guys who did that book? Uh, James Oliphante, I mean, and um, Warren Wait, Warren, I forget the name of it, but they put out the book a couple of years ago where they even bring archaeological evidence that the Vespasians were creating or infiltrating Christianity because their, low, their, their seals and everything were used by Christianity before even the Jewish war. Um, but they think that Paul was probably not part of this, that there was also another, that part of Christianity was still offering this mystery cult and hadn't been uh, completely uh, infected by the Roman powers. And Joe Atwell himself says that the Gnostics were 
an answer to the Roman corruption of Christianity because their writings are so full of parody. They're making fun of the Jewish uh, orthodoxy. They're making fun of the Roman government. They're they're very in a very subtle way. They're mocking what Christianity had become and the power of the Roman Empire. So it's a matter of when it happened. I mean, my issue is that people always assume that when Christianity came out, you had the four Gospels, uh, John, Mark, Luke, and Matthew. But that's very far from the truth. I mean, you had Marcion in the second century saying, we need a Bible. We need a coded document, a teaching document for this religion. And Marcion went with his idea of uh, the letters of Paul, a few, and Luke, and his, his version of the Gospel of Luke. Marcion also believed we should abandon Judaism and Christianity should be completely like a new religion. And there's two gods. There's a God above God, and then there's the Jewish God. And of course, that pissed off the early church in the middle of the second century. But the point is, we didn't, most of Christianity didn't have this idea of four gospels. Now, you have to go to Irenaeus around 180 AD. He says, all right, we're going to get some Gospels, and I am picking four Gospels, and they don't have names. I'm going to give them names. John, Matthew, Luke, and uh, John, Matthew, Luke, and, and, and Paul. Not Paul. John, <laughs> Matthew, yeah, Mark, and Luke, and I'm going to give them names. But then you find out when you read the letters of uh, Irenaeus in 180, he's already in the pocket of the Roman emperor, Commodus from uh, Gladiator, you know, the corrupt little shitty shit, guy, you know, Marcus Aurelius' son. He's in the pocket of the Roman power. So you're already seeing there in the power. So the question, what I'm trying to say with this long winded discussion is, yes, the Romans got a hold of Christianity. The question is, when? And how much did they get it? Because again, the idea that there was four gospels is a second century idea. See, I don't think that's really the question. Mm. I, I because, and I think that's what that quote that I just offered from Josephus, it pulls us in a different direction. Let me play for you a clip from a very excellent historian, Adrian Goldsworthy, who I interviewed on the show. And, uh, uh, this will kind of lead us into a, a related discussion, but a little bit different discussion as well. If you write about, you know, I've written about Caesar, I've written about Antony, Cleopatra, Alexander the Great, you'll never quite know what someone else was thinking when they do something. The danger is that you create an image of what you think Caesar was like or Cleopatra was like. And then when you come to a gap in the source, you fill it in with, well, this is what my Caesar would have done. So that's a great one to start with. And then there's another one I want to play from you. A couple more I want to play from you from there. Here's what I think we're doing with this. We know how the game ends. We know that Christianity comes to dominate the world on every level, not just on a spiritual level, but on an economic level, on a human suffering level, all these ways. We know how the game ends. So we're always crippled by that in putting the pieces together. What I read in Josephus there is these guys weren't that smart. I mean, if you look at what a half-assed attempt this was to run a PSYOP. Yeah, it, it didn't work. I mean, the second century, they rose up again, middle of the second, they rose up again, and Hadrian had to destroy Israel. And Christianity was not even a big player till the, what, third, fourth century? It was sort of underground. Exactly. Most Let's process that a little bit differently, because the way that I'd say is, if you look at this and you go, what kind of harebrained scheme is this? You, you but think- But the CIA screws up a lot, Alex. Exactly. I mean, you, you know, which, they, which they is- money, They screw up all the time. I, I, to me, that's just making the point. You know, you don't have to be good. It's the kind of throw it against the wall and see what sticks kind of thing. And that's how this looks to me. The idea that we're going to get Judea, which has been a real pain in the ass. But mind you, they're not the biggest pain in the ass at, by any means. And again, our history now always wants to write it up as if Oh my God, those damn Jews were so tough. Well, maybe they were tough, but they weren't any more tough than five of the other provinces you're fighting against. That just is written up because that becomes the story. Judaism, here's the, here's the truth bomb. 
Judaism, this stupid thunder god, minor little religion, has no business being dragged through history. The only reason it is dragged through history is because Roman PSYOP number two, which we can't assume they imagined would be as mere, nearly as effective as it was, but it really took off and they got the pieces fell in place and they co-opted this rising new thing called Christianity. They didn't even care what it is. And hey, you need another, you need the villain in there. Well, the Jews, yeah, I, we washed our hands of it. And those freaking Jews, they killed Jesus. Growing up in Chicago in the Greek Orthodox Church, I don't know why we didn't like the Jews, but I just had a sense as a kid we didn't like them because they killed Jesus kind of thing. We've dragged that for 2,000 years. But the point is, when you look at this original PSYOP, you see some of the things that you're saying is that, of course, this was a silly PSYOP. It had no business working. You know what? The second one, the Christian PSYOP was just as silly. It had no business working, but it did work. But let's be mindful of what Adrian Goldsworthy is saying and not look back on the whole thing and try to put all the pieces together as if to say, well, Judaism, what a wonderful tradition with the thunder God and follow all these rules and spin around three times. And you know, it's just... It's just more of the silliness. And what Christianity emerged out of that is completely designed to control the population. As we saw Constantine, can you get a less authentic spiritual player than, than Constantine? He certainly wasn't Christian, whatever the hell he was. So that's the level of deconstruction I want to do on this thing. And I know I've laid a lot on the table, but you can kind of see where I'm kind of pushing back on the the narrative that we've been conditioned to kind of buy into. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> Again, you have to look at everything as I'm learning. Everything you thought you knew is false. Everything you learned right after is false. I mean, it just, it continuously goes. And I should add to this, I think to the Romans, it was important because the, the, the second temple was a huge cash cow it was one of the biggest buildings in the world they were they were making a ton of money from taxes so they did have some vested interests and then they decided oh screw it this is too much of a pain in the butt let's get rid of it yeah for your listeners uh watch that movie uh, air america with tom cruise which kind of shows you what cia does they just throw money they have so much money the Romans were doing that with the experiment. So it's a question of why Christianity, as some have said, uh, an exclusive religion was probably better to work with things. Some have said the cult of Mithras was becoming so, po it was much more popular than Christianity. But the problem with the cult of Mithras is that it was a Roman soldier religion. It was very popular and it had Persian origins. And it might have been like, oh shit, what if Mithras is a Persian psyop and the Parthians are going to use this to bring down the Roman Empire? So we need a bulwark. We need something to counter it. So we're going to create this god or this religion that's pretty much very similar to Mithras, you know, the, the host and the sitting down and the formalities and all that. So that's another uh, idea that definitely has to be explored of why Christianity became what it is. Because like you said, it was... Uh, uh, again, Hadrian had to destroy Israel because the Psyop didn't work with the Jews. Christianity was just a small religion that uh, Romans and uh, Greeks and others scoffed at until the third, fourth century and how it became true. And in fact, even then, the idea of Christianity being this world player is kind of false, Alex. Uh, you've had uh, Diana Pasulka on your show and she's actually her first job beside being one of the leading authorities on ufology was a catholic uh, scholar and she said that the roman catholic church that we know didn't really happen until the 12th 13th century it was a very loose uh re relaxed people went to church maybe once a month uh, the church didn't have as much power the pope wasn't even in rome he was in france it was only until the Inquisition and the Crusades that Rome, that the Catholic Church became this sort of corporation that we know about, world domin dominating and all that. And before that, you had, it was loose. You had the Byzantine Empire, which had its thing. You had all these different sects going on and eliminating each other and vying for money. So even our idea of this 
holy church popping up and ruling the world and killing witches and all that that's that that didn't happen until the middle ages so it's interesting how uh yeah how we learn these things let me throw a couple other clips on the table so the the point that you're making there is something that me and david matheson talked a lot about and that is the the mithras cult the mithran cult and I, I think it's best understood, and David certainly agrees with this, as a secret society rather than, than a cult or a religion. It was a bunch of soldiers getting together, deciding who are they going to assassinate. And I think it's been copied over and over and over again throughout history. These guys, you know, when Vespasian takes power, becomes Caesar, they had gone through a period of a year where they had assassinated four different emperors. So they'd come in yeah. and the secret society would get together and say, nah, don't like him so much. Boom, he's gone. Next one's gone. And they were the ones ruling. I mean, does this sound a little bit like today? Here's a clip. Between Bobby and the FBI up his ass all the time, he's going fucking crazy. Tell Jimmy I'm sorry for his troubles. The old timer spoke to the old man. The old man taught this son Jack, and he told him, don't forget who the fuck he owes. He knows who the fuck he owes. Let me jump in here for just a minute and explain something, because I think I kind of threw Miguel off a little bit with that clip, and maybe I threw you off too. That's a clip from The Irishman, and that's Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro. And to me, this is like listening into the cult of Mithras. This is listening into these guys who got together, who really ran the secret society that brought about the phony Christianity that we have. So I, I kind of explained that a little bit to Miguel, and then I pivoted over to a clip from David Matheson and the interview we did about all this good old Roman psyop stuff. Here we are talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and in particular, the Copper Scroll. It was all rolled up on copper, and so old these scrolls are found. The Dead Sea Scrolls mm -hmm. found in the 1940s, fragments of over 900 texts, manuscripts, and in thousands of pieces like jigsaw puzzles, discovered in the 40s, and then given into the hands of an international group of scholars who kept the Dead Sea Scrolls basically under wraps for their entire lives. They didn't let anyone see anything, but there's one scroll known as the- Copper. The Copper Scroll, and you see it on the right-hand side of your screen. It looks very different than the, the written scroll. The Copper Scroll, it was, <laughs> it was all rolled up on copper and so old that they had to cut it in part. And so that's why these pieces now look kind of like, like a half of a tube. What is the Copper Scroll? It's basically the list of treasure. This is how it reads. This is the first words of the Copper Scroll, not the part that I'm showing, by the way. That's like piece number 18. But on piece one, it says, in the ruin that's in the Valley of Acor, under the steps with the entrance at the east. So you go to the ruins, find the entrance that's on the east. Then under the steps, a distance of 40 cubits, a strong box of silver and its vessels with a weight of 17 talents, which, by the way, a talent at that time, New Testament talent, or that period talent, 129 pounds. So that's 129 pounds of silver times 17. That's a lot. Okay, so uh, still, still some more I got to throw on the table since I have Miguel here. But you see where I'm going with this. The first clip, the reason I played the long Joe Pesci clip, is that's what's happening in Rome. That's the meeting of the Mithras cult. That's how they talk. And that's how modern day guys talk about we're gonna knock off the fucking Kennedys, we're gonna do this, we're gonna decide who's in control. What Matheson is adding, which I think is, and this is the contrast to what you were talking about, right? Is the spiritual, when did Christianity come? And what about Augustus? What a, hey, I, I, I'm down for all that. But first, don't we need to understand the more uh, materialistic, archaeological kind of history and the human history of what we did? Here's another interview that just shook my world. I'll pull it up on the screen, and it's a guy named uh, David Brody, and he wrote a book called Romerica. And what he found was all this archaeological evidence of the Romans being in America 
in the second century. But the connection to it is much, much more interesting because what he says is in that second sacking of the temple, what he suspects happened is that the Roman, uh, the Ninth Legion of Rome, which is this mysterious legion that disappears, you know, they just kind of disappear from history. Well, they were in, if you know anything about Rome, they have these legions and they kind of go off to these far parts of the empire and they kind of never come back. The Ninth Legion is in Britannia for like 40 years and they're all married up with all the Welsh girls and all that stuff. They have, they've, they've never been to, and suddenly get the orders and saying, hey buddy, need you back in Judea. You guys didn't do it the first time, we're gonna do it. What he suspects is they went there and they got to the door and the guy said, look, do you want to kill the temple? Or I'll tell you what, I kind of know where there might be some treasure. And he goes, yeah, but uh, what, 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 what's going to happen to you? you? You give me the treasure, you're going to get killed, right? He goes, that's why I was thinking, maybe I come along with you on the boats, you know? And that's what he finds. That's what the archaeological evidence says. They not only find all these Roman coins, David Brody does in his book, America, but he also finds where they've built in the big Medora in the in the earth and all these other Jewish religious symbols in second century America. So here's the here's the upshot to that. And then I'm gonna get back to but I want to lay the whole thing on you. I gotta give you the whole picture to get your to get your full answer. Back to Adrian Goldsworthy. Let me throw out one pet theory, just indulge me, it'll be short, but it's kind of emerged from a couple of different guests that I've talked to. So Josephus kind of famously says, hey, and I, I have a revelation, you're going to be, you know, Caesar, and the, in the Copper Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Copper Scroll is a treasure map. And at the bottom of the treasure map, it says, and this is a copy. Josephus being Josephus, super elite among the Jewish elite, what if he knows basically the idea, what's in the information contained in that copper scroll? What if he has the treasure map in his head? And what if that is his real bargaining chip with Vespasian? Because it is interesting, isn't it, that Vespasian, who is the soldier, soldier, but really, you know, in unique ways, isn't in line to be the emperor, doesn't have the bloodline, doesn't, you know, it has kind of been cast out by Nero something happens and now he goes down to egypt and he seems to have a lot of dough to assemble an army and he shows up in rome and everyone's like oh okay i guess you're the guy how far off is that do we have anything that would directly contradict that idea i mean the thing is you've got to remember the timing so this is 67 nero's still alive until a few months later where all the bad decisions and the craziness he's done i mean i've just been to the british museum I could listen to Adrian Goldsworthy for a long time, but it's probably a little bit too much for this show. The point is, he's not unfriendly to the theory that what we're really looking at in Josephus is not someone who psychically had a precognitive vision of Vespasian becoming empire, but a guy who knew where the fucking silver was buried and said, bring me along and I'll show you where the treasure is just like the ninth roman legion did 60 years later or however many years later that is it's just it's it's just human nature this is how things get done this is how joe pesci and bobby de niro would have done it what do you think i've laid it laid it but this is caesar's messiah 2.0 this changes it substantially it's not about a grand conspiracy they were not that smart they were just doing the next best thing like you're saying just the next thing well what what might work well throw this thing out there that the whole jewish religion is we're, vespasian is the messiah oh that didn't work okay throw this next thing out there let's see if that works yeah government propaganda let's try different things we see it today we see it throughout history so it makes sense and yes i've also read yeah they have found roman coins and i think brazil or Nor northern south america so yeah this all makes sense perfectly uh and like i said I, I like where you're going with this because this shows how governments work <laughs> how the mind control works i mean we'd all like to think there's a doctor evil with some grand evil scheme but 
like you said, it's people trying to save their jobs. It's think tanks. It's uh, people being greedy, wanting to retire first. The, the different Roman soldiers simply wanted to make money to bring back to their family. And that's always important in any situation. So as I say, it's complicated. And uh, I would agree with you, too, that Mithras, or I'm going to state Mithras, really is the overarching god of Western civilization. He really rules our days today, and from skull and bones to uh, so many secret societies, and he keeps popping up, even in the Persian times. And it's a sidetrack, but if someone said the people like Cyrus and all those, they probably were secretly worshipping Mithras because this is the kind of god that gets things done, because they would sacrifice animals and Zoroaster very much said, you do not sacrifice animals under the religion of the Persians. But you see these hints going on and these this Mithra keeps popping up here and there. And so, you, again, you wonder if there was this parallel competition later on with Mithras and Christianity. But I think in a way, Mithras uh, continued to be the ruling god of Western society. I guess the big question, Miguel, that I'd love you to dive into is... How are we to understand our here and now history? Back to the beginning of this interview, this reaction that we all have to what we see going on in our day, just like people have seen and reacted to throughout history. They had their own thing. How do we balance that with this extended consciousness relationship that we have with gods, with spirits, with other entities? Because I think that's so much what your book is all about and your work is all about. And we, we have to serve both. So how do we do that? Well, as I, as I tell people, the game doesn't change. The most important thing is you're waking up and your inner flame or soul or consciousness. That's the most, I tell people, it doesn't matter if you walk out today and you see Bigfoot or you see an alien ship land or you find out that the Rockefellers are still worshiping Mithras and ruling our the United States government. Your job is still the same, which is to wake up and find out what your purpose is and move there because uh, these things are fun, Alex. But, you know, for example, JFK, it's so obvious, it's tedious. What did James Corbett, or Corbett say? Uh, conspiracy is just history plus time. There's so much time with JFK that I can't believe anybody is still holding on to the notion of the single shooter or whatever the hell. But you're still going to have yearly conferences with JFK, people going and arguing and debating and paper. That's going to go on for generations. So you might as well not, you might as well continue going down the path like you from uh, Caesar's Messiah 1.0 to 2.0 or finding out Mithras or all this stuff, all this journey that we're in. But the game hasn't changed. You need to keep waking up. And you need to be as good as you can and be there for others, the least of our, our brothers, as I talk about in Aeon Bite. And the answers will come. But the, the other things, yeah, in a way, it's fun. But compared to infinity to, as you say, extended consciousness and all that, it's a, a drop in the bucket. You know, Don't lose sight of the big game, which is who you are, which is just an amazing individual that has purpose and meaning in this world. Can't, can't, can't top that. Unbelievable, Miguel. So tell folks as we wrap it up, what's going on with you in the, in the Aeon Byte world? Oh, lots of stuff going on. I keep putting out the shows with some uh, amazing guests and my, my intros, I keep trying to level it up. For example, in a show, I don't know if it'll be out. Did you know that there was a serial killer that got made into a Buddha? Anguilimala. And, uh, you know, you read these things and it just, you know, if you just, for the normal person, like, oh my God, Buddhism sucks. But to me, it's like, this is a new dimension to go explore. How did the Theravada Buddhists make a serial killer into a Buddha? How does a serial killer become a Buddha? 
Uh, so this is so fascinating things that uh, really say more about ourselves and we can explore parts of ourselves and our relationship uh, to things. And I'm trying to work on sort of a, a book about, uh, I've written so many articles on Gnosticism and all that. I'm trying to do a compilation book. Uh, hopefully by the end of the year, I want to have like a, a good intro course on Gnosticism, an online one, so people can get the, the real dope and none of that new age stuff that is out there. So yeah, just doing a lot of voiceover work. I'm doing a lot of audiobooks and commercials to be able to uh, set a career on that one. So if any of your listeners need voiceover, I, uh, I am your man. I'll get you, uh, as I like to say, stellar results with down-to-earth professionalism. That's my tag. That's a tagline <laughs> I'm just for the, <laughs> that I just whip out, you know. So um, awesome. So that's well, it. Yeah, keeping busy. You, 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 Otto, we need, we always need more Miguel Connor. So never enough. Awesome having you on. Thanks again for joining me. Thanks for having me. Fun as always, Alex. Thanks again to Miguel Connor. And thank you for sticking around for part two of this interview. The one question I tee up from this interview is what do you make of the cult of Mithras secret society? Is that what it is? I mean, it can be that and a religion and a cult. It can be all those things. But is it a secret society that is probably running these kind of psyops, the same ones we see today, but maybe the same ones that happened back then? That's, of course, the big question, but I'd love to hear your answers to it. Again, let me know what you think. Engage, connect, share, and stay with me. I have some great shows coming up. Until next time. Take care. Bye for now.